Okay, so this is a quick demonstration of the right kidney in situ. So let's take a look at this fascia here. This is the fascia transversalis, which is coming out of the posterior, and this is the one which is splitting to form the anterior layer of the renal fascia or the gerotus fascia, and we have removed it. Under that, we can see a layer of fat. This is the perinephric fat. The perinephric fat covers the kidney from the front, and we can see some more of the fat here below, and the perinephric fat also goes behind the kidney, and we can show it here. You can see the perinephric fat is behind also. The same fascia, anterior layer of renal fascia, there's a posterior layer of renal fascia. And behind that will be another fat, which is called the pararenal fat. But that we cannot see now. In the lower part, the renal fascia is not fused with each other. The anterior and the posterior layers are separate. Why? Because it is filled by this perinephric fat. And this has got an important clinical significance. When a person undergoes rapid weight reduction and fat loss, this fat is not there to support the kidney anymore and the kidney descends down. And that is called nephroptosis. So that is about the fascia covering. Now let's take a look at the kidney itself, the right kidney. Straight away we can see that the, on the superior pole of the kidney there is this organ here. This is the right suprarenal gland. It is also enclosed in the same fascia, the suprarenal fascia, but there is a septum which clearly separates the suprarenal gland from the upper pole of the kidney and my finger is running along the septum. So this is the septum which separates the suprarenal gland from the kidney. And the suprarenal fascia in turn is adherent to the undersurface of the diaphragm. So this also has got a clinical significance. When, if the kidney descends down, as I mentioned, called nephroptosis, the suprarenal gland does not descend down it remains stuck to the undersurface of the diaphragm. So this is also an important point to be remembered. Now let's take a look at the parts of the kidney. This is the superior pole of the kidney where my finger is located. This is the inferior pole. And we can see that there's a slight lobulation of the surface, which is the persistence of the fetal lobulation. This is the anterior surface, and this is the posterior surface. Take a look at the orientation of the kidney. The kidney is not exactly horizontal. It is slightly oblique. So therefore, the medial border is anterior medial and the lateral border is posterior lateral. And this also has a clinical significance. When a patient is lying bedridden for many months and years, urine tends to collect in the renal pelvic cell system. And that can produce a calculus, which is known as a staghorn calculus. So anterior surface, posterior surface, medial border, lateral border, inferior pole, superior pole. These are the parts of the kidney. This region... This is called the renal hilum. And these structures which are entering and leaving the renal hilum, they enter into a space between the anterior and the posterior surface of the kidney, and that space is called the renal sinus. And the renal sinus contains the renal vessels, the pelvic calicial system, and it also contains the perinephric fat, which extends in. Now let me show you the renal vessels. Take a look at this, this structure here. This is the abdominal aorta. And this is to the left, and this is the inferior vena cava, which is to the right. So we have the renal vessels coming straight from the abdominal aorta and the renal vein draining straight into the inferior vena cava. The renal artery is posterior because it is thick-walled, and the vein is anterior. So what we can see on the right renal kidney is this structure anteriorly. This is the right renal vein. We can see the left renal vein here, and straight away we can see that the left renal vein is much longer than the right renal vein. The right renal vein is located anterior in both the sides, the left renal vein is also anterior, but the left renal vein receives this vein here. This is the gonadal vein on the left side. In this case, it's a male, so it's a testicular vein. If it's a female, it'll be ovarian vein. And this vein also is draining into the left renal vein. This is the left suprarenal vein. We notice that the left renal vein is running anterior to the aorta for the same reason, so that it does not get compressed. Left renal vein can be used as anastomosis for the splenic vein to form what is known as a spleno-renal anastomosis. And here we can see this is the splenic vein. And the splenic vein is located very close to the left renal vein. So we can use this to form an anastomosis. That is called the spleno-renal anastomosis, which is used in cirrhosis with portal hypertension. We also notice that 
the left renal vein is running under this artery here. This is the superior mesenteric artery. So the left renal vein can get compressed between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta, where my instrument is located. And that is known as the left renal vein entrapment syndrome, also known as the nutcracker syndrome. So we have seen some important clinical correlations pertaining to the left renal vein. The right renal vein does not have any of those problems because it is smaller than the left renal vein. In contrast, the renal artery on the right side is longer because the aorta is on the left and the artery runs behind. So we cannot see the artery here, but we will be able to see it when I reflect out the inferior vena cava. Let's take a look at the structures, branches which are passing through the hilum. One I've already mentioned, this is the renal vein. In this case, it's the right renal vein. We can see some structures behind. One here, one here, one here. These are the segmental branches of the right renal artery. This is the right renal artery, which is behind the right renal vein. The re renal artery, as it comes, it divides into five branches. A superior, an inferior, anterior superior segmental, anterior inferior segmental, and posterior segmental. So we can see three of those segmental branches right now. We can see one segmental branch here. We can see another segmental branch here. We can see another segmental branch here. And more will be visible once we have dissected out the renal hilum. And in this dissection, we can also see the third structure coming out from the renal hilum. And that is this. This is the right ureter. The point to be remembered about the right ureter is that as the ureter descends down, it has got a covering of fascia around it, and that is called the periureteric fascia, which is a derivative of the renal fascia itself. But more important, if you look very closely, you will find that it has got a plexus of blood vessels on its surface, and we can see the plexus of blood vessels. And we can also see some blood vessels are supplying the ureter. This periureteric fascia is very important because all the blood vessels run on the periureteric fascia. So during surgery, we should not remove the periureteric fascia. If we remove the periureteric fascia, we will produce avascular necrosis of the ureter and that will lead to leakage of urine postoperatively. So that is about the, the ureter. Okay. So we have cut open the left kidney. Actually, my assistant has done a wonderful job of cutting it open. So we made an incision along the lateral margin and we have slid it open. So what do we see? The outer rim is a thin rim of renal capsule, which I have lifted up here. And you can see this is the renal capsule. Just after that, this pale portion that we see here on either side, that is the renal cortex. And after that, everything else inside is the medulla. And finally, this innermost portion that we see here is the pelvic calicial system. So we have basically three parts, the renal cortex, the medulla, pelvic and seal system. The cortex is the place where we have the, all the convoluted tubules, the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, etc. Coming to the medulla, we see pigmented areas. These pigmented areas are referred to as the renal pyramids or the medullary rays. And if you look very closely, you see that they have a striated appearance and they have a striated appearance. This is where the collecting ducts converge, the collecting ducts of Bellini. And in between two adjacent pyramids, we have this white portion here. This is the renal columns of Bertini. And this is through here that the blood vessels enter into the kidney substance because the blood vessels are coming from the renal hilum. At the apex of the renal pyramids, we have this convex projections. These are referred to as the renal papilla. And they communicate with the concave minor calyx, and that is where the filtration of urine takes place. One renal pyramid with half of the adjacent renal column and half the adjacent renal column, this constitutes what is known as a renal lobe. And that is how the urine drains. From the minor calyx, it drains into the major calyx, and from the major calyx, it drains into the pelvis, and from the pelvis, it drains into the ureter, and that's how it drains into the pelvic calicial system. So this is what we see in the cut section of the kidney. So this is all the structures which I wanted to show you in the kidney and the, all the associated facial relationships and the vessels. 
Thank you for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal.